First Baptist Church. It is Sunday, March 22nd, and the church is, the building is empty. This is kind of an odd situation for me. After 30-some years of ministry, this is the first time I preached to an empty sanctuary. But I know that the church is here. I know that we are all here, and we're praising God and worshiping God together. So we should start with a song. Cindy, you love to sing, so join me in singing the song. And it's kind of a different one for today, but it's a simple song. It simply binds us together. I hope, I hope that you all know it. I'm going to sing it. I want you to sing it out loud with me. So let's sing. If you happen to have a hymn book at home and can run and grab it, it's number 343. But it's always good to sing. So let's sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together with love. Oh, you all sounded very good. I didn't hear any bad notes at all, so that was wonderful. It is really cool. Hey, I know that this is Facebook Live, and I know that you can type little messages there on the on the one side of the screen, and I will try to read those, but I am not a good multitasker, and I will try to read them and maybe respond to a certain degree, but I will not type messages at this time just because I can't. I'm not good at that. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to attempt to do that. So type messages if you like, type messages back and forth to one another, but it's good to be together even in this way. Social media, I'm not a real big fan of social media. I use it on occasion. I text and I Facebook. I don't do some of the others, but it's interesting that in the midst of this pandemic, here we are, and it becomes our avenue. It becomes the way we're, the way we're ministering. So you know, it's, it's just some practical things that come out of this. You'll notice that, that I'm actually facing west. Uh, the baptismal, which is on the east side of the pulpit, is to my back. As I was putting this together, I realized that uh, something you guys have probably realized forever. It, it, when you're looking up at me from down below, that light from the window, which is up off over here, that light really is kind of hard to see. So Maybe something good, something practical. Maybe we need to block those windows or at least cover them somehow. I know that you all just thought it was the halo surrounding my head, but, you know, it's not. It's the light coming. Anyway, we'll go with that. So that's, so that's why I'm facing this way. That's why my back is to the, to the baptismal because that light was almost blocking out the camera and so just spun it around. Um, but it's good to be together. It's good to, to join. I want to just throw out a couple things for prayer. Continue to pray for Siegfried as he wrestles with some health issues. Pray for the Maresh family and the passing of Sue Wright, who is Wendy's mom. She passed away last week. Yeah, I believe it was last week. It might have been, might have been. Yeah, I think it was last week. I mean, she passed away, so be in prayer for her. Be in prayer for this whole virus situation, the, the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus because there's a lot of people being affected, not just with the virus, but with the ramifications surrounding the virus as far as paychecks, as far as uh, living, having the ability to buy and purchase things. So let's just spend a little bit of time in prayer. I'm going to be a little silent. Some allow you to pray to yourself, but then I will also will pray as well. So let's just simply bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, first and foremost, we come to worship you. And I know that we're not able 
to gather and bump shoulders and embrace, talk. But at the same time, we come to worship as the corporate body of Christ. And so I just praise you that we do have this opportunity. And as we uh, maybe comment back and forth with the comments on the side there, as we talk back one to another through texting and through Facebook messaging and other avenues, Lord, allow us to continue to worship you. May your name be blessed. May you be honored. We do pray for people in our congregation that are struggling, maybe financially, maybe emotionally for Wendy and her family in the, in the passing of Sue. We pray that you would strengthen them and get them through, bring them courage as now even the funeral itself because of this virus will have to be put off. We can't even end that or close that chapter yet. But God, you are good to us. We praise you for <clears throat> watching out. For others who are not well and not doing good, we just lift them up before you. Heavenly Father, we also pray that we would be servants to one another in these moments, in these times, recognizing that here are, here are opportunities for us to serve each other as much has been taken away. We can't go to events. We can't go and, and gather in venues in, right now. And so we can call and talk and get a hold of people and share and minister. So maybe this is an opportunity to do some of that. We pray, Lord, that even today would be a time of learning and growing and fellowshipping in this kind of odd cyber way that your grace would continue to guide and lead us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just telling you, this is strange. <laughs> I look out at the congregation. They're out at the sanctuary and it's empty. And yet I look at the sidebar and I see a lot of people, a lot of you have joined us and that's kind of, that's cool. The understatement of the day, we're in the midst of a pandemic. You all know that. Everybody knows that. It's a term that we've probably all heard, the word pandemic. Do we really know what it means? The word pandemic does not in and of itself refer to a disease or an illness or a plague that might be cruising across the country. The word pandemic itself describes how extensive that disease is. And WHO, the World Health Organization, has declared this to be a global pandemic. There is no place that is immune from the coronavirus. There is no place that is immune from COVID-19. It, the, the, the disease itself, as I said, is COVID-19, and as you all know, the coronavirus. But the word pandemic simply means the extent. It also talks about it being worldwide, mysterious, formerly unknown, and outside of human control. We are not really controlling this virus. We're trying to minimize the spread of it. But even as we close off our meetings and shut down our services and close out all events, realize there are still pe people still getting sick, people still suffering. So we're not controlling it. We're simply minimizing its effect. And that's what a pandemic describes. And then you can put whatever plague you want there as far as what plague it's, the pandemic is referring to. Part of the problem, too, is the situation changes daily, almost hourly. Our governor and our federal government uh, make decisions and hand down edicts constantly I, I believe at this point, every event that I can think of is canceled. Restaurants are doing only takeout or drive through. Everything changes constantly all the time. And the questions that come up for us for Christians is, what about faith in these times? How is a Christian to respond during these moments? How does our living faith cause us to live in moments such as this, a pandemic as this? Our governmental leaders are making decisions. And, uh, and, and although I think some of them are making, are thinking through the ramifications of those decisions, I'm not sure that they really are uh, touching closely to what they can do. There will be financial ramifications to these decisions that they make. When you, when you close down a business, understand that people are suddenly out of work. I spoke with 
a printing business yesterday and, and they're wrestling with whether they should close. They said, we have 40 employees that work on an hourly basis. How do we just tell them we're not going to pay you for the next month? Very difficult. One writer says, governments have often failed to anticipate and support citizens through the social and ep economic impacts of pandemics. And a man by the name of Graham Mooney, he's a historian of medicine at John Hopkins, he writes, these crises expose social inequality. Now, I know that the federal government is setting aside money to disperse and distribute across the country. I don't know that that money will ever get to Auburn, Michigan. There's too much corruption in people, too much corruption in business. But whether it'll get to Auburn, Michigan is yet to be seen, but I, chances are it won't get here in time to pay the consumer's energy bill. It won't get here in time to pay April's mortgage or rent payment. Won't get here in time to make sure that we have food on the table in the coming months. <clears throat> That's the problem with the pandemic. It also causes disappointment. I was just approached by the question through Facebook today. What about Denver and Caitlin's wedding shower, which was set for today? Well, it's all canceled. We spoke with her parents, and they've got to travel in from a distance, and there'll be other people who travel in, and we just can't do that. So that's, that's off. I have a good friend that I went to college with. His daughter has worked for four years to be accepted to the DECA conference in Washington, D.C. She's raised all the money she needs. She's worked hard. And as a senior, she was looking forward. It's off. It's an international event. It's over. It's canceled, not postponed. It's done. She misses her opportunity. Uh, one of some friends of ours had planned a trip to Italy. Of course, that's done. Italy, you can't even get in. And I know that we probably all have our stories of disappointment. We all have our stories of people that have, lost plans, have to make new plans. Uh, to make matters worse, things change. Moment to moment, hour to hour, we never know exactly what businesses will be open. Uh, they say what events will be canceled, but the answer to that is all events are canceled. Nobody's predicting an end. When, when will this pandemic end? Now, let me say this, it will end. We will come through this. Isn't the first pandemic? I done a little research. There was, a, there was this type of thing in 1918 almost 100 years ago, we will come through these things. I've talked to different people about the events that shape our lives. For many of you, you remember when John Kennedy was shot. That's an event that shapes your life. Most of us remember the Oklahoma bombing. That shapes our lives. Of course, we remember 9-11. That shapes our lives. Remember the shuttle explosion, the shuttle Challenger explosion. Those things shape our lives. This event will shape our life. We'll come through. There's no doubt there but it will shape our lives. It will change us. I have talked to several people about when we're through this, what will be normal? What will be the new normal? Will we go back to business as usual or will there be new normal? We know that after 9-11, there was a new normal, particularly in the area of travel, air travel, but God will get us through and we'll work this out. And I believe that as we trust God, we'll be better for it and better in the end. But how are we to respond? I believe that the first lesson that we need to remember and look to is <clears throat> to remember that God is still the controller of the past, the present, and the future. What's happening is not aimless happenstance. I am so glad that I believe in creation, that I am a creationist. I am so glad that I, don't, that I know there's a purpose behind this. This is not just dumb luck. This is, this is not just events happening willy-nilly. I believe with all my heart that God has a purpose and God has a plan. God is still in control. He is still sovereign. The Bible reminds us in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. This does not make him any different than what he has always been and who he has always been. The book of Malachi says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. God does not change. Isaiah in chapter 45 says this, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its, its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace. I create calamity. I 
the Lord do all these things. And then in chapter 46, he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times. There has not yet things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. God is in control of this. I'm so grateful that we serve a God who handles this, who does this, who works this. In a quote that is very applicable for today, A.W. Tozer writes, while it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes, there is a God who has not surrendered his authority. Get a hold of that. There is a God who has not surrendered his authority. I know it's hard to understand, I know, but in spite of that, I know that God has not changed. God is not against humanity. Understand that this event is not God hating people. I've been asked a few times, not a lot, but a few times, is this, is this ushering in the end times? Is this the first salvo of entering in the, uh, the end times? And the, the answer to that is we don't know. Only God knows. So the answer is not yes, it's not no. It's only that God's in control. And God can take care of this but only God knows for sure. Remember that quote from Tozer. God has not surrendered his authority. Closely following God's sovereignty, I believe that we as believers need to understand God's care for his people. Psalm 29 records, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. God loves and cares for his people. And that love and care has not changed just because we live in uncertain and dangerous times. Again, in Psalm 46, the Bible reminds us, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, we don't need to be afraid. God is still looking out for his creation, especially his people. We need not fear that God has forsaken us. You know, if you look in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter, of course, Nehemiah is prophesying the destruction of Nineveh. We know that from the story of Jonah, there was a point in time when Jonah, because of Jonah's representation and his prophecy, saved they repented at that point, but Nineveh eventually became wicked again. Maybe it's the old, you can't, a leopard can't change its spots thing. I don't know, but they became a wicked nation again. They followed after false gods. So we get to the book of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is prophesying the destruction of Nineveh. And in chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, we read, the, we read this. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. And, and God is just coming down on Nineveh. He's destroying and, and the, the destruction of the city of Nineveh. But if you look, if you happen to have your Bibles, you had opened there, you'll notice that those are verse in chapter one of Nahum, those are verses five, six, and eight. And in the middle of that, we have verse seven. In the middle of God bringing all this destruction down on Nineveh, we have verse seven, which says, But the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. In the midst of in the midst of the destruction of Nineveh. God says, but I know who my people are, and I will take care of them. In the midst of this pandemic, God knows who his people are, and he will take care of them. Now, God is our defense and protector. It does not mean that we'll come through unscathed. Don't listen to the people that make a mockery out of Psalm 91. Please, don't listen to that. I just heard on the radio the other day a pastor who was serving in France for a period, helping a Christian radio station get started there, 
way before the pandemic started, he and his wife had been for a while. He, when he came home, he had the virus, a pastor. He, he had contracted the virus. Uh, it, just because we're God's people does, doesn't mean we won't suffer. Doesn't mean we're, we're not going to get hit with this thing. But it does mean that God is with us. Yea, though we walk through the valley of this pandemic, the shadow of this pandemic, God is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. God loves us way too much to leave us alone. The Christian response is to remember that God is watching out for us and taking care of us, even, even with all this is happening. A third response is that, that I think that we as people of faith need to remember is to watch out for the people around us. If you read the Bible, if you've read the first couple of chapters of the first book of the Bible, you understand that there are a few questions being asked. And one of the questions, maybe not the first question, but one of the questions that is asked in the Bible is, am I my brother's keeper? God had confronted Cain, and where's your brother? And Cain cries out, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer to that is, yeah. To a certain degree, you are your brother's keeper. Here, take care of him. We go back to <clears throat> the word keeper means to hedge about, to guard, to protect, to take care of. It's the same Hebrew word that are used if you go back a chapter to chapter 2, verse 15. It's the same word that used when God put Adam in charge of the garden. In chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Then the Lord took Adam the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it, which means to protect, to let, maybe even literally put a hedge around, but to watch out for it, to maintain. Adam was put in charge of caring and tending God's creation, and in a similar way, we are put in charge of helping our brothers and sisters as much as is possible. Some of you know the passage from Matthew 22. Pharisees come at Jesus. I'll simply read it, Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34. When the Pharisees heard they had silenced the Sadducees, he had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, saying, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great commandment in the law, the first and great commandment, he said. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love for God and love for others. Fulfill all the law and the prophets. The church needs to rise up and reach out. The church will rise up and reach out. You know, it's interesting. As I've read through this and I've actually looked up, there's a lot of history on plagues and pandemics and epidemics and all that stuff. And it, one of the things that really rises at is, is that the church has risen up. Historians bear out the fact that the church has become the source of help. It is said that, and simply read some of the stuff I pulled up, it is said that during a plague in the Roman Empire in the second century, a plague that they called the Antonine Plague, Christians made a name for themselves as they cared for the sick. They also offered a spiritual model whereby plagues were not the work of angry, capricious deities, but the product of a broken creation in revolt against a loving God. And so they really not only helped lives, they really turned minds and changed opinions. In the third century, still in Rome, another plague they called the Plague of Cyprian ravished the empire. Christians at that time, we were encouraged to redouble their efforts as they cared for the living. At that time, the bishop Dionysius recorded that Christians, heedless of danger, took charge of the sick, attending to their every need. The church has in the past risen up, and I believe that we as believers will rise up again. We, we, will, not leave, we will not leave our brothers and sisters in Christ or simply our friends alone. How do we do that? Uh, let me just say this to a sociologist by the name of Rodney Stark claims that the death rates in cities with Christian communities during the first and second century, the death rates may have been half of those without Christian communities. So history bears out the church has risen up, and I believe that we will today. But how do we do that? Well, a lot of ways. I encourage you to be ingenious and be creative. But one way is to make phone calls. Maybe we can't go visit. In fact, we're encouraged not to go visit. However, that works itself out. But I encourage you to make phone calls. You know, social media is fine, and we're using it right now, and that's a good thing. 
But remember, somebody can post a smile emoji while tears of fear run down their face about how they're going to pay the next bill or put food on the table in the next months. Maybe they have enough for now. But as we all know, you get behind financially, it's hard to catch up. And so call people, talk to them, hear their voices, share their hurt. We can't fix it necessarily, but we can care. Call people. Another way is to make sure people have the necessary items to deal with the basics of life. You know, these events bring out the best and the worst in people. <clears throat> I know that some companies have offered to postpone bills, and that helps a lot. I know that other people are hoarding items, and it's a sad situation, which, again, helps make the pandemic worse. But I encourage you to not overbuy. Share. Don't, don't selfishly hoard. Share what you have. Make sure people have the basics of life to live. Something as simple as toilet paper and flour or whatever. Just make sure people have enough. If you're able to give, give. Another way, if we can, is to possibly help with financial assistance. I was talking with an individual today, and they were on their way home from visiting family down south. And on the way home, they got a call. The business is closed. You don't have a paycheck until we open again. And when will that be? Nobody knows. If you're able to help financially, maybe pay somebody's bill. Maybe offer to help them financially. The church can help. Encourage you to talk to myself or to our deacon and let us know if we can help. We're not flush with cash, but we have money. We can help with some of those basics. At least keep you on an even keel until this thing passes by. So help out financially. And then the last one I have here is pray openly with people. If perchance you are out picking something up at the store real quick and you run into someone you know, pray with them. Don't hide this. Don't, don't make it silent prayer. Don't make it unspoken or prayer. Make it open prayer. I'm not sure you should be shouting in the, in the rest in the grocery store, but openly pray with people. Openly let people know where we're coming from, that we serve a God who is in control. We serve a God who is taking care of us, and as a result, we're trying to take care of people as well. These are uncharted waters. Nobody, nobody knows where we're going. We're just sailing along. But if we sail together, it's better. So I encourage you to keep in touch. I encourage you to understand that God is sovereign. God is powerful. I encourage you to, to understand and to know that God is going to take care of us and then that we can take care of it as much as we can, that we can also take care of each other. We'll get through this. Services, again, are canceled for the next two weeks. Hopefully, we will celebrate Easter Sunday together. So I believe that's the second Sunday in April. Hopefully, this will be past enough that we can meet again. In the meantime, God bless each one of you. God be with each one of you. Let's bow in prayer. Father, I just thank you for this medium that we can communicate and contact. Ask God for each person in our communities that you would just care for and watch out for. Those that have, that have contracted the virus, heal them. Those, who, who's, those families maybe who have lost someone to the virus, God, comfort and strengthen them. For our teachers, for our medical staff, for those that are working with trying to find a cure, Lord, give them wisdom, give them grace, bring peace to all of our hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God be with you all. I'm at the church. If you need me, call. Have a great day.